Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's Career Chat. I'm Krista Harmon. I'm with the Kent Intermediate School District's Workforce Development Team. And I'm really happy to have Dr. Blunt with us today. She is a dentist and a her own practice. She owns her own practice. We're going to talk about that today. So welcome, Dr. Blunt. Thank you. Welcome. I'm happy to be here. Well, here at Career Chats, um, we love to hear about your career journey. We like to start back when you were 15 or 16, Dr. Blunt. Do you think you grew up <sighs> Business owner and a dentist? No. <laughs> I always, um, I was always a math science person. I didn't know what field I wanted to be in, and I always knew I wanted to go to college. I knew that for sure. Um, I wanted to be a doctor. I didn't know what type, so I just talked to different, <laughs> I talked to dentists and doctors. I was initially going into pharmacy because at the time my dad had a pharmacy. So sometimes parents can tend to guide us in a certain direction. But um, <laughs> once I got to college, I just decided I didn't want pharmacy. I was going to have a doctorate of pharmacy. Um, but I just pictured myself working in a store, which is not um, the entire role of a pharmacist, of course. But I just looked at different fields and I chose dentistry. So I love that you as a young person were already talking to adults in the different fields. And that's why we're doing what we're doing today to model that informational interviewing so young people will ask questions. So why did you think even being a doctor, what about that sounded attractive to you at the time? That was kind of your North Star. Wait, say that again? Yeah, why, why did you already know in your heart that you wanted to be a doctor? How did that become your North Star of somewhere in those careers? I think it's my family. They were always college or just guide us towards college and going as far as you can. And I liked healthcare. And so I said, well, you know, I want to be a doctor. I just, my favorite game being young was operation. Can you believe that? I just love to play operation. So I guess it was just, uh, um, just in me. <laughs> I love that. So it sounds like um, in addition to playing operation, the game, um, <laughs> you were good in science and math. And so you kept your grades up because you knew that you were going to try to achieve to be a doctor. So it was school pretty serious for you. Absolutely. Um, we had, I came from a family of just a college that was just the direction that a lot of us had taken and a lot of my parents, um, brothers and sisters have t were taken. So I took school seriously, even in, um, when I was in elementary school, I was always one grade ahead. So by the time I became a senior in high school, I had calculus at the at high school. It was actually Grand Rapids Community College. They had an instructor that came to Creston High School at the time. So when I went to University of Michigan, the credits transferred. So at U of M, I did not have to take calculus because I had uh, because of the the college class in high school. So I thought that was great. That's really great. It saves you money. Now, I know a lot of young people um, struggle with where does one even start to choose their college? Was the fact that you wanted, did you know that you wanted to go to dentistry at that point or did you start just like pre-med? pre Pre-med. Pre -med. It's because I was initially going into pharmacy. So really the first two years with pharmacy, dentistry, med school, all that, the first two years are about the same because you have to have your core classes. Um, and at that point, once I just, decided that I wanted something different other than pharmacy, that's when I started looking into different careers. Yeah. Now, as far as University of Michigan, I picked that. I didn't want to stay in state. I didn't want to go too far. So initially, of course, the goal was pharmacy. So I applied to Ferris and University of Michigan, accepted to both. And since I, I thought I'd just stay at U, go to U of M. So. I know that a lot of young people, when they watch this, wonder, how did you choose dentistry even versus orthodontics, for example, or, uh, you know, those other similar, there's some things that are similar in those jobs. What were the factors? Well, to be to become an orthodontist or any kind of specialist, you have to be a dentist first. So after high school, you have four years of undergrad, undergrad meaning, you know, undergrad um, college. And then you have an additional four years of the, the med school, dental school, whatever field it is. And so I chose dentistry. So after the four years, now you're at eight years, undergrad and dental school, that makes eight years. Then to specialize, then you go into orthodontist or periodontist oral surgery. That's another three or four years. And so you, I thought eight years was enough for me. And actually I did, I completed in seven years instead of eight. I only went three years undergrad. I was able to test out and apply for dental school and I was accepted. So I went three years undergrad and then four years of dental school. 
And then if I wanted to specialize, it would be, like I said, another three years. Um, but there wasn't one area of dentistry that I liked more so than the other. I thought about being an endodontist, a root canal specialist. Um, but I just, a general dentist, you have, you just get a chance to treat patients in different areas. And I like that. I like the different fields of dentistry. So. Well, that's what I'd love for you to share right now, Dr. Blunt, is what, what do you do on an average day? And why don't you address some of the myths of what people might think a dentist even is outside of what they just see? Well, a lot of times they just think I go to the dentist when I have a toothache, <laughs> you know, and they think pain, but I, we are to help you not have pain, not to give you pain. And then when you come to us, we help teach you and educate you on different things you can do not to, to help reduce your tooth decay. Because right now with society, we have sugar everywhere. I mean, we just have so much sugar available to us. Um, if we don't know how to take care of our teeth and manage what we take put in our bodies to help maintain our overall health um that's that's a problem so part of not only treating is educating so you have treating and educating um so that's one of the different things that people just don't realize with dentistry they just think oh i just go have my teeth cleaned you know <laughs> or i just have this filling done but it's a little it's more involved than that it's really important for young people who have teeth understand that that's a piece of being a dentist that's different is that you get to teach in addition to fixing teeth exactly right mm -hmm. we educate and treat which yeah. is which is a nice avenue dental hygienists play a big part in that also the dental hygienists actually clean the teeth or treat you for periodontal disease gum disease and a lot of the education comes through the hygienist also so hygiene is another field that you can actually enter with a three-year degree and that one, that's for cleaning. There's a lot of fields. You have dental assisting, you have a dental hygienist, and you have the dentist. The dentist has an assistant to help. And that the, the assistant helps educate the patient, comfort the patient, guide the patient. She helps me chair aside, or he. There are male dental assistants also. Because you need someone to front desk. You have someone right next to me at the chair side to pass me instruments, to, to get the supplies, to help suction. Um, this help with the whole procedure. And then the hygienist, they clean teeth, polish teeth, place sealants, which is a, pretend, a protective coating that goes over your baby teeth or adult teeth, usually your adult teeth um, at six years old. And then you have, of course, the dentist. So that's why the young people don't understand if they like the idea of dentistry, that there's some different support roles in addition to being the physician with the eight years of school. Exactly. Yeah. Um, when you think back to your college days, Dr. Blunt, what do you think were some strategies that got you through that education? I have to imagine it was pretty rigorous education. Did you end up with study groups? Did you um, have any fun while you were in college when you were have your head down? Let's <laughs> talk about that. I, I did have fun in college, but I made a decision that I need to go to college and get out. I wanted to get in and get out. I did not party. I didn't, I, you know, you'll go to certain events here and there, but I did not pledge as a uh, sorority. Um, I didn't, I was focused because I needed to, I was there to go to school. You know, I wanted to get in and get out. I didn't use it as a play party time. I used it as a serious time where I had to get an education. And so, you know, you have fun. You establish study groups, you establish friends, um, and you just have to have someone that's like-minded. And that, that's a big difference. You know, if, if someone was around me that wanted to do, wanted to quote unquote party and I wasn't a heavy drinker or anything like that, I don't drink now. Um, I didn't, I just associated with myself with people that had the same goal as I did. And study groups are great because you need to test each other. You just need the camaraderie. You just need, you need the support. So, and I still have friends now. Yeah, all these years later, I still talk to them and associate with my friends from college. Now, all of them are dentists, but <laughs> just friends from college. You need that support group. Yeah, that's such a great strategy for young people to understand that you don't have to do it alone, that you do have to press into other people. And that's such great wisdom to find like-minded people, to not be led astray. Right. <laughs> right. So don't feel bad if you see a group of people that want to do one thing and you don't. Most of the time, when you exceed or excel, you don't follow the crowd. <laughs> you usually stand aside or separate and you're going in a different directions. So. 
as part of the dentistry program, do they have like clinicals or internships? How does that um, kind of hands-on education fit into the schooling? With dentistry, we see patients in the school. So once you're, like I said, you go to undergrad, the first two years of dental school after undergrad, you're it's your sciences, um, your anatomy and biology, microbiology, physiology, the first two years. And then the next two years, you start treating patients. You first, you have a lab with a, it's called a type of dent. dent. It's a model of teeth. And then you transition from a model to a patient. And so you see patients in the dental um, operatory, in a, in a dental chair for two years. You have to have um, you have to complete so many crowns and so many dentures, so many fillings, you have requirements that you have to have um, treat patients for periodontal disease. So we don't have residencies or internships. Basically, we're doing it in the dental school with a dentist. Uh, we have certain clinics that we see patients in. And so that you can do a residency after dental school if you want to just get more involved in different areas of dentistry. But for the most part, once you graduate from dental school, you can open your practice like I did or join another practice. Yeah, I did want to talk about that part. Um, I do have a question, though. So when you were in that lab part working on real patients, can you just share some of those initial experiences and how you felt? Were you nervous? Did you... Were you a little overwhelmed? Did you feel pretty prepared already? Because I think you want to get a reality check there. <laughs> it's different uh, uh, placing a filling on a type of on a model and then you're transitioning from that to a patient in a chair with a tongue, cheeks, and saliva. Big difference. And so there's a filling that may take me 20 minutes now. We have four hours for the first filling. And it's just insane when you think about it now. Like, how did you have four hours for that patient? Um, but you transition and you have your um, instructors to help you. And your instructors are dentists, of course. And usually they have a private practice or they're there full time. But it was, it was, it was, um, Exciting, interesting. <laughs> we practice on each other for certain things, like when we had to give anesthesia, when we had for people that I hate to use the word shots, I say injections, <laughs> or we have to numb you. We had to numb each other first, or if we had to take impressions, we took impressions on each other first. Um, so as as much as we can do with each other, meaning other dental students, we did X-rays when you know the unallowable amount. <laughs> so. It was fun. So you begin to see who you want to be your partner and who you rather not be your partner. So <laughs> yeah, I love that. That's just such an interesting insight for young people to consider. Again, you're you're gonna want to align yourself with someone that you see is is at your skill level or even a step above so you can learn from them. Right, exactly. Conscious choices. <laughs> you didn't want the class comedian as your partner. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So you get this two years of hands-on training, and then when you graduate, again, you can join a practice that already exists, but you chose to start your own. Tell us about that thought process. Well, um, my parents had a business, so I didn't. I came from a, a family that had a business, so I'm, I was familiar with accountants and lawyers and um, business ownership and opening and closing and stuff overhead. It wasn't staff for them. It was employees for them. And I was an employee. It was an involuntary one at the time because we were kids, but <laughs> it became voluntary. Uh, I don't know when. <laughs> anyway, and so that helped. My dad had the building. Um, he was not a dentist, but he presented me um, options when I was in dental school. And I told him, only if I own the practice, I will pay you rent. So, when I was working, I went to the library at the time. I checked out a book on how to write a business plan. And so I, I wrote a business plan from a book. And that business plan is what allowed me to get financing for my dental office. So I, I was always an achiever. I just wanted to if hey, if it can be done, let me find out how. So I just went to the library and, and took out a book. You know? <laughs> I was like, how do I write this business plan? So I did. I want to brag up on you for a minute. How old were you at that time, Dr. Bob? At that time, I was probably about 23. Because at 18, I graduated 18, and then four years of dental school. That's supposed to be about 24. And then two years into it, to five, 26. Yeah, it's about 26. 
Yeah, yes, some, of us, yeah. some of us adults are going, wow, you know, that yeah. I went to the library to get a book and, you know, that's <laughs> it. I, I was financed. <laughs> I thought that was great. So. What were those first couple of years like being a business owner, managing that? Answer, 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 answer. Different. Yes. It, I, that is one thing I could say. While you're in high school, learn about money and financing and just learn how to budget and plan your finances. Just don't pull out a credit card, debit card, whatever. Have a budget. Um, one thing I noticed with colleges, they're really quick to allow you to have access to a credit card. Learn to pay in cash. You know, try to start pay cash for what you buy. I mean, just actual dollar bills, not a debit card cash. I don't know if you guys heard of Dave Ramsey. That might be a good avenue there. <laughs> but um, anyway, just learn to pay with something, but just $10 or $20 bill. You look, you said, man, I'm paying $20 for this versus taking a card and just swiping your card. It's just, a, it's a, it's kind of eye-opening. I think it's good for all of us actually need to just keep in mind, you know, we may not be so quick to buy certain things. Yeah, it sounds like um, that was part of your business acumen that you knew the value of the dollar, you had seen your parents run a business, you knew the cost. So again, you were pretty serious about this, um, this venture. And right. so you started business, you're now a practicing dentist. And is there anything that you would like to share with the young people about that early dentistry um, lessons learned? things you might do differently or things that were just really a plus for you at that time of life? I would say you don't have to do it alone because after two years, I did work with a, a dental practice uh, consultant and that was eye opening and it was life changing. And the gentleman told me, he said, this does cost a lot, but I am going to impart into you things that will last a lifetime of your practicing career. And he did. It has been quite a few years now. Should I tell you how many? <laughs> it's been about 33, believe it or not. I have been practicing 33 years. Wow. The tools that he gave me, um, I, I use today. And he did, it was a life-changing um, decision. Like I said, it was costly at that time. But when I look at it, at it now, it was a decision well made. So always seek counsel when you need help or you feel you need help. It's there. It is out there. You have to actually reach out and ask and seek help because the help is there. So that's new to me, even as a career developer, that there's people who make their living as dental practice consultants. Oh, and absolutely. That's job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't yeah. know. Yes, they do. Yeah, yeah. so you hire them. Practice management. Mm -hmm. Okay. They help you budget, let you know. Um, this is as far as your percentage of how much your supply should be, considering how much you produce in the office. That's the other thing. They People don't see the d business part of dentistry because they just see the, the treatment, the surgical portion um, or the treatment portion. But there's a business part to it, too. You know, how many staff members you should have, how much time it should take you for a certain procedure, how much the procedure should cost and what your lab costs need to be. So you have your lab costs, your supply costs, your staff, you have insurance. Um, there are just just so many different costs that have to factor you have to factor in to what you're doing. What are the pros and cons on maybe a young person likes the idea of being a dentist, but maybe not the business side? If you're part of a larger practice, do you is it just different that way? Then you don't have to be concerned. Or are you still part of those business decisions at a, at a practice maybe has lots of doctors, for example? Yeah, you can. There are a lot of group practices now, and actually. Um, pretty soon there won't be too many private practices anymore. It'll be like medicine where most of it is corporate owned. Um, a dentistry is going in that direction too. We just don't see it now. A lot of the private practices look like private practices, but they're not. They're corporate owned practices, but that's the direction dentistry is taking. Um, but you can go into group practice and it helps because you have, one, the cost of the equipment. So maybe if you have a CBCT, which is an x-ray unit that helps you see 3D. And so maybe the cost of that equipment can be shared between multiple doctors, eight, nine, 10 doctors. You know, you don't have to worry about vacations or um, as far as not being covered when someone leaves, things like that. And group practices are nice. But then you have the skill set and you're, a lot of dentists are very independent. And so it's kind of hard for them to work with, the, <laughs> with you know, eight or 10 other uh, dentists. So, um, but there's no harm in in starting with a group practice or starting with a clinic, um, the Indian reservations or small rural communities. And sometimes you can have your student loans forgiven if you spend so many years 
in a certain clinic or a certain um, location. So that's an option too, you know, so and everything is not forever. You can make changes in where you work. It's not as fast. I mean, you, you have to be more committed. Um, you don't just change dental offices every three to five years. <laughs> it doesn't work like that normally. So, but there's That's different avenues. Great piece of mentor advice though, that, you know, you can make the changes. Cause I think a lot of young people feel trapped that if they make a decision, they're stuck with that for the rest of their lives. And that causes a lot of anxiety. Um, so thank you for pointing that out specifically. I know my young friends um, who watch this love to know what your favorite part of your day is and what's the least favorite part of being a dentist. I love cosmetic dentistry. You know what I, I really like when you have a patient that comes in, they're afraid and they're scared and you treat them, you get them comfortable. And I tell people I have a vision. I have a vision of a perfect smile and my goal is to get you there. And that's what I do. And that's what I picture to make uh, their mouths complete. And I love it. I love it when they're done. I tell patients most treatment plans take about two years. So just go step by step. It didn't happen all at one time. So, you know, just go step by step. And before you know it, you look back and it's done. I mean, really, and the students I'm talking to, what do you think two years back? I mean, do you remember what you did two years ago? Most people don't. It's like, what did I do a couple years ago? I don't know. Well, that's how fast it goes. It's like with braces. When someone wants orthodontics and they have braces, before you know it, it's over. You're like, wow, that was two years. It's gone. So it's like that with our mouths, too. Yeah. Um, the things I don't like, I don't like, um, dentistry is costly. It is. You know, if people <laughs> say it's pain in the mouth, not us giving the pain, people coming in with pain, and then pain in the pocketbook, because sometimes it's pretty costly. And um, I don't like it is that it is so costly for some people. And then the avenues that they have for treatment don't um, warrant them maintaining their teeth. They end up having to have them removed instead of keeping them through a root canal or crowns. And that's hard, you know, if, but root canals can be expensive and crowns. And so if you don't have the funds for that, then it has to be pulled. Pretty tough when you see the economic um, disparities and like you say, the treatment costs. Mm -hmm. um, and and how, do you, how do you deal with that emotionally knowing that you're gonna have to pull it and that person doesn't get that. Like, is that something that wears on you or you just have good coping strategies that it is what it is because that's their life? I mean. Well, no, because there's different avenues. We yeah. have partial dentures, we have implants, there's other things that can be done. And just because you had to have the tooth pulled today doesn't mean it can't be replaced. Um, I don't take that on me because God is God and he's the one that he has all power. He's the one that can set things right for people. Um, but it's not, again, we talked about everything is not forever all the time. Tooth replacement is available through partials or dentures or crowns or bridges. So there's other avenues. So I, again, looking at the end and not where you are right now. So I still look at the end result. So how do we get you to point to that? Yeah, like you say, some of your initials, you want to um, remove that pain for them. So right. you, you want it to stop hurting. And right. then like you say, the, the cosmetic part to build it back up takes time. Exactly. Yeah, that's great. What are um, one of the stories when you think about your patients over those 33 years, Dr. Blunt, that you just went to bed going, that was a really good day. That was a sweet experience. Are there some stories that pop in your mind? Um, not one directly, because I just, there's a lot. There's just so many that I just, I just love the end result. Even today, um, just, just bonding. I, I love, like I said, bonding front teeth, the cosmetic effects when people come with just a missing tooth and then you place the implant or you pay, place the partial and you do bonding and match another tooth and it's just it's just I just love what I do <laughs> it's such a joy as a career developer to meet people who you know love their job so much I love that and your smile you can see yeah. you still have such a passion for it it's okay I do I do because I have a passion for people you know yeah it's just... and that's that's really um when we think about personality traits or values that make a good dentist what would you like of what you've seen of dentistry. Obviously you have to be a people person and in fact, caring for them, right? Right. And that's one thing with any and every career, you don't go into it for money. You have to have a passion. You have to have a desire. You have to really care about your patients. That's, that's a big one too. You have to have, a, have compassion for people. You know, you can't, um, you have to see everyone as yourself. You know, what do you want? What would you want someone to do for you or do to you? You know, so and don't judge people, you know, just again, I have everyone, I just look at the end result, 
where do I, where do they need to be to have a healthy mouth? And if you look at everyone the same way, then you don't have to worry about anything else. Just treat everyone the same way. Yeah, those are, those are great values. I think about my own hands, Dr. Blunt. I don't have very good manual dexterity. Is that something that you had early on? Is it something you can get better about? What other natural skills do you think dentists maybe have? Um, you do have to have perceptual ability. Um, basically, the hand-eye coordination, you have to be able to see 3D. You have to, to help because you're visualizing. You're seeing patients. You're treating patients. They're laying back, so you're working through a mirror, so everything is reversed, and everything's small. You're dealing with millimeters and not – I tease my husband because he's a builder. I said, you build outside, I build inside. He deals with feet, I deal with millimeters. <laughs> but um, – the manual dexterity is, is a, a huge one. Um, it's nice to be able to, uh, I don't know, I guess I lost my train of thought for a second there. <laughs> I just got engrossed in the manual dexterity and envisioning what you have to design because you have artwork. You're designing a tooth and you're designing a smile. So a DDS is a doctor of dental surgery. So you have surgery, that's the extractions, the implants, and then you have actually fillings of surgery because you're cutting a live tooth. A tooth is vital and alive. It looks hard. You smile, but if you chip it, break it, or evolve it, you'll feel it. That's pain. It's alive. It's just a hard structure like our bone. And so you just, I like just the the just the the whole artistic portion of it because you can have patients that want veneers, and so you're changing their smile. So you have to look at colors and designs and shape. So it's not just, you know, you have different avenues, and that's where the specialties come into play as far as the oral surgeon versus the endodontist root canal specialist or the prosthodontist that that um, places veneers. There's just so many, de the dentistry is just so broad. Even with public health, if you say, I don't want clinical dentistry, I want to be involved in public health. So there are a lot of dentists that's a field too, public health and dentistry. So. That's so great. And I, I guess I want the counselor, school counselors on here to know too, in addition to the students, that if you have a student that's really good with art and math, this is a really good suggestion. Um, my own dentist described it that way. She loved art and she loved math and that's what made dentistry such a good fit for her. So I hope that that's a good takeaway for some of the students and uh, counselors today. Yeah. We have approached those last two minutes, Dr. Blunt. I hate that, but um, you've been such an amazing role model and all the good wisdom that you have shared. But what would you like to leave with students as kind of a final word of wisdom as they're exploring what's next for them? Do what's right for you. A lot of people will have a lot of ideals and um, just thoughts, opinions, but you have to make a decision what is good for you. Everyone may not be college bound. Maybe there's some people just like to work with their hands and work with tools. We need engineers. We need carpenters. We, we need, there's, there's just so much. There's just, there are so many fields. So take your time and see, and ask the Lord, ask God, what do I need to do in my life? You know, because every field is not for everyone. So you have to take the time and do what's right for you. And that's what's going to make you happy. That's golden. That's golden stuff. Yes. That's why we do career chats, Dr. Blunt. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for sharing your valuable time with us today. Thank you so much. And I'm going to um, stay on if anyone wants some other career resources, but we'll let Dr. Blunt go. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Cool.